So on this episode of Lifted, we decided to take a trip to Back Bay and get together with Patrick Ahern, a successful business client out of the Back Bay area. The reason why we chose Patrick Ahern is because of his success in the, in the business field. Not only did he become a really good architect, but he became really good on the business side. In his words, most architects don't, aren't very successful because they don't understand the business side of it. And that's what we wanted to explore with them today at Lifted. Also, some of the things that we look for for Patrick is the fact that he took a very unusual route to success. He went to a two-year school, so he started from a community college and worked his way up. So for me, it showed a lot more road bumps and trials and tribulations that helped him get to where he is today. So we look for Patrick here to share this story, to get to know him a little bit better, and give us some ideas and tools that we could use to be successful in our own business of choice. So let's go check out Patrick over there in the studio. All right, so I'm Patrick Ahern. I yes. appreciate the opportunity to be in your office to learn more about you, you. and what you've been able to accomplish. Uh, I'm looking forward to this interview. <clears throat> so to be able to do this, I want to really get an understanding of what you've been able to accomplish from beginning to end childhood all the way up until what type of advice and guidance you would give others so they can be successful in your field of work. So if you don't mind walking me through, kind of talk to me about your childhood. Where were you raised, born? Sure. Well, I was, uh, I was born uh, in, uh, in New York, in Long Island, and I basically uh, was raised in Levittown, which was a community built uh, in the late 40s through 1951. It was 17,556, a virtually the same house built in four years. So it was built on the potato fields of uh, Nassau County in Long Island. And it was really designed for uh, GIs coming out of the war, World War II. And the houses cost uh, $6,900. They're about 825 square feet. It was $100 down and $66 a month. Um, the good old times. It was the great old times. <laughs> but the houses were really... Um, special in that they were designed for expansion and rather than a gridded street pattern which was the typical way things were planned in New York it was built on a thousand and one lanes so even though the houses had the same floor plan they had slightly different facades and each house was modulated and every house came with a weeping willow tree, two apple trees um, and, they, and they had these beautiful floor to ceiling window walls that you could move out and two way fireplaces, slab on grades so no basements Radiant heat in the floor, so when you're a little kid, you'd fall asleep on the floor in your pajamas. It was great. I love it. So that was, that was my, my roots. of. Um, Where did the love for cars come from? Well, um, I've always loved cars since I was a little kid. And my father, uh, you know, liked cars. And, you know, so he always had some interesting vehicles that I, that I had, uh, you know, around that I could look at. But I, I gravitated to an interest in cars at an early age, and... From the time I was about five years old, uh, I either wanted to be a car designer or an architect. So, uh, car design, architect, you kind of had to finagle your way through into which one you wanted to cook, to kind of go for. Which, what made you, what, how did you come up with that decision? Well, you know, um, back in the, in the 50s and in the early 60s, uh, when I was in um, junior high school, um, people didn't really know it from a guidance counselor point of view, like how to become a car designer. It really wasn't something that most people understood, but architecture was a time-proven profession, and people would say, well, you know, there are architecture schools, and, uh, you know, they date back from the 1800s. So my guidance counselor really was pushing me, saying, well, I know you like cars, and you draw cars, and you draw houses, and things like that. Uh, you can always, you know, play with cars, but if you're thinking about a profession, architecture is a clear road that you should consider. So... I went so down that path. The importance of guidance and guidance counselor really helped you in that situation because if you right. didn't have that, we were not quite sure what you would have kind of transpired. Right, because I was told, well, if you want to be a car designer, you have to become an engineer first, and that didn't seem all that exciting to me, you know, when you're 14 years old. Um, and I used to, you know, build cardboard houses for my train sets, oh, cool. you know, and I would take these Levittown houses that I would redesign and reimagine. <laughs> Uh, at a shirt cardboard. I mean, you know, my parents were divorced when I was a young kid, and, uh, you know, so we were living in a 
you know, lower income kind of community. And, uh, you know, I didn't have any money to go buy the really nice German-made houses for the train sets, so I would just make them out of shirt cardboard myself. So you was an architect since what age, really? Like seven years old, maybe. <laughs> so you always old. had it in you. You just didn't quite know that that would be your That's passion. Right. That's right. The guidance right. kind of brought That's that right. out of you, so you decided to, to take on this career path. How, does that, how did that start? Where did you go to school? And how did... Well, you know, uh, again, coming from a less than financially secure environment, uh, I went to a community college for two years because it was inexpensive. So you started at a community college? I started at a community college. It's, it's called the State University of New York Agricultural Technical College at wow. Farmingdale. Wow. Because it was, uh, was, the semester was $125 a semester, Four. of which I got a, this is in 1968, and I got a $50 New York State scholarship. And I was working in a Baskin Robbins ice cream store, uh, and I was also buying junkyard Volkswagens for $25 and rebuilding them, and then selling them for $350. You just had an addiction to make things better. Right. I and so, that. so you know, I, I said, okay, this is something that I could handle because uh, particularly my father's told me when I was graduating high school that I was totally on my own and, you know, he didn't really much care if I went to college or not. And he never graduated high school So himself. why go to school? Why, did, why go to college? Well, because I really at that point was really committed to being an architect and... You have to go to school to be so you had the love, so the love was there. So the passion was there, the love was there, and I had the uh, mental fortitude to uh, figure out a way to how, to how to pay for it. And so I went to community college for two years. I graduated from that, and uh, and then I went on to a four-year college, at New York Institute of Technology, and um, which was less expensive than Syracuse University, where I ultimately finished. Um, and it was on Long Island, so uh, I didn't have to, you know, think about a lot more expenses and so on. And so I went there, and they took all my transfer credits, which was really important. So I went there for uh, two more years, and I got a Bachelor of Science degree in Architectural Technology. And, and at that point, I had, trans I had applied for transfership to Syracuse University for a Bachelor of Architecture degree, which is the first professional degree that you need to become an architect. And um, they didn't take all my courses, but they took most of them, and I went to summer school to make up the ones that I needed. Now, and, didn't you get sick at some point? Well, so what happened was, um, when I was uh, at New York Institute of Technology, uh, I had appendicitis attack. Wow. And... Uh, Back then, back then, you had to get parental consent. I was not quite 21, and my parents and I really didn't have a relationship. And what happened was, back then there were no computers, so you really needed to get a hold of Western Union, and it took about six or eight hours before they could get permission to operate on me. And by then, when they went in to operate, my, tent, my appendix burst on the table, gangrene set in, I lost 46 pounds, I almost died. Wow. But what happened was, uh, I, I basically had to take incompletes for the whole semester in school. And I had a really low draft number. This is during the Vietnam War, and there was, there was the draft. So my number came up, and I had a report for a physical in uh, Fort Hamilton, Brooklyn, New York. I passed the physical, and a few weeks later, I found out that I got an induction notice to, um, to get drafted into the service. While I was, you know, back in school and going to go to summer school to be fully matriculated the following fall, by no fault of mine. So that put me in a very difficult situation. Here I have an induction notice to report to Fort Dix, New Jersey in two weeks. While still I, recovering, correct? Still, well, I, I had gone back to school, but yeah, I was weak and, you know, and I was trying to deal with all that. I don't think he was ready for the exam and, and uh, no. the physical exam either. No, but, you know, back then... You, go, you walk around in your underwear and carry your <laughs> stuff, and you go to the last station is the psychiatrist. And I sat down with the psychiatrist, and I said, look, this is a big mistake. He says, I've heard that before. <laughs> I said, no, really, this is a big mistake. Really you know, I really didn't drop out of college. So I went back to the draft board, and uh, I learned to have to you know, present myself and my credentials and, and, and sell an idea that they didn't necessarily believe in the beginning. Mm. 
So that was a little pressure on me to also continue to uh, do well in school. So what I did was, um, because I had these other degrees already, uh, unbeknownst to the architecture school, I applied to the graduate program because I already had a four-year degree, I could do that. And since the graduate school was separate from the architecture school, I got admitted to the graduate school in urban design while I was still finishing my undergraduate degree for the Bachelor of Architecture. So I was taking 21 credits in two different schools at the same time. And no one knew that. So, when, so what happened was I got a Bachelor of Architecture in May of 1973 and a Master of Architecture in August of 1973. And nobody figured it out until I was about to graduate from the Bachelor of Architecture program. And they said, well, I see that you've got all these other courses you've been taking. And I got a lazy in them. Well, how'd you do that? I said, well, I did. <laughs> I said, well, you can't do that. That's not allowed. I said, why? The well, says I can't, and I did. And so I'm the only ever one, only person in the history of Syracuse University ever to do what I just did. That's awesome. So I was able to then finish the, the, the master's program. Which created opportunities moving forward. So. And so I packed up my little Volkswagen and um, moved to Boston. And this is, again, before computers. I had my big portfolio of drawings in, in the back of the Volkswagen. And uh, went through the yellow pages looking for a job. So you didn't come here with a job already lined up for you. You kind of created an opportunity, created an opportunity for yourself once you got to Boston. So it was more about I just went through the yellow pages and hit the pavement and walked into people's offices and presented myself. So that's been the story. So let's have a little bit of fun here. So what 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 has happened? What have you been able to accomplish after getting to Boston? Well, um, I started working for you know a couple smaller firms, and one in particular they had a four day work week, ten hours a day gave me an extra day to find a better job. And so I did that. And then ultimately, I worked uh, my way up through uh, the ranks to um, a large firm that was doing some fabulous work called Benjamin Thompson Associates. So I got to work on Faneuil Hall Marketplace. Wow. And with my urban design degree, I was able to have a strong design influence on all the public spaces around Faneuil Hall. That kind of ties into the education in Syracuse because it kept you in a different lane as well. So you're, That's right. That makes sense. So that really was terrific. And then I, uh, I, I also worked on three major hotel projects in the Middle East, in Abu Dhabi, Al Ain, and Cairo, wow. uh, after Faneuil Hall Marketplace. And then I was offered a position in another firm across the street, the Architects Collaborative, to become an urban designer for a new petrochemical city from scratch in Jabal, Saudi Arabia, because I had this Middle East experience and I knew their culture. And I understood, uh, you know, the culture and the religion and and their society because I had spent the three years working on these other projects. So that was an interesting thing. But at the same time, I was doing some moonlight work, converting back bay buildings into condominiums. It was the first time that people were starting to think about living the in the city again. Period, right? And the Renaissance. These were all right. abandoned, burned out hulks of buildings and so on and so forth. So not only did I start to do that for the young developers, but I was able to, uh, I sold my car, uh, I, I found a building to buy, I got the, the older couple to give me a second mortgage, and I, I sold everything I had to buy a building right across the street from, from where we are right now, 165 Kamea, for $145,000. I put no money down because I sold everything I had, plus a second mortgage from the homeowner. That part right there is what a lot of individuals aren't willing to do. So you sold everything, 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 just to be able to take enough money to put a deposit on your first commercial building. That's right. How many it, apartments? Well, it was nine apartments, and back then it was rent control. So in order to do anything with it, I had to get people to leave on their own. Now, thank God I was single, and the, women, and the building was filled with young single women. So I had to charm my way through how to get them... It sounds to, very it, painful. It was. It was, it was <laughs> tough. And some of them are still friends with me today. That's awesome. So it's I found them other places to live, and, and so I was able to do a condominium conversion. Um, it did a really nice job, which, which really um, preserved a lot of the original architecture of the buildings, but created these new spaces that were exciting, and, and it was really the, the advent of that kind of work and I've done over 400 buildings in the back bay in the last four years. 400 yeah. buildings in the back bay. Yeah. 
both as architect and developer, or developer and architect. You had your hand in a lot of because yes. of your diverse experience. That's right. And also, That's right. And also Newbury Street. When I first came here, there were no outdoor cafes. The Back Bay Neighborhood Association thought anybody having alcoholic beverage on a sidewalk would be terrible. And so I, through presentations and, and, and working with the Architectural Commission, I gradually convinced people that this would be a good thing in using the European model of outdoor cafes and animating the street wow. and helping, the, and helping the, the retail establishments work and creating, carving out the basements and creating those secondary retail stores that we all see up and down Newbury Street. I was the person who designed those first dug dugouts of the basements back in the early 70s. So for yourself at this point you've done pretty well so would you consider yourself one of the leaders in this field I'm probably one of the most successful architects but and I practice what I call non-ego driven architecture at the end of the day you never really knew I was there wow you know I believe in preservation but I believe in, in creating spaces the way people want to live today right. and so it's not just museum quality work so I offer kind of a somewhat of a different direction and, I, and my brand is what I, what I call it. Is my brand is really a lifestyle brand that, that is based around architecture. So would this be a, a guidance for future architects coming up that want to do well in this field? Yes. Most architects that practice are terrible business people. Most architects don't know how to make any money in this profession. The old mantra used to be architecture was a rich man's hobby and a poor man's profession. And people believe that. They say, well, it's like indentured servitude to go work for like a, a name architect, and that, that's what you're supposed to do in life. Well, that's ridiculous. I happen to be a really good business person that is an architect. How did that happen? Well, some of it, I think, really comes from within uh, and my desire to survive. And not be complacent as well. And not be complacent and take risk. And take, yeah. Because I had nothing to lose. So... I think at an early age, I, I came from that. And I, and I will say, having grown up in New York, there's a different mindset when you live in that environment. And it's a little more, let's cut to the chase, let's not dilly-dally, let's make decisions, let's move the question, and, and don't, you're not afraid. I mean, New Yorkers are, in many ways, I mean, that's why people don't like them so much, is because they're arrogant, and they're loud, and they're forceful in their opinions. And... Uh, at the same time, it's, it's a very dynamic uh, culture that creates uh, unique opportunities for people to be successful. If you can succeed in New York, you can exceed anywhere. It's a lot of people working in New York. So very populated. So, it's so, so I made a conscious decision not to go to, back to New York when I finished college because I didn't like the culture. I didn't like the environment. But having that DNA within me when I moved to Boston, which was much more civilized. Also, the scale of the city was human, and it was the most European of American cities. And at the same time, what was so important for me in my profession was, in Boston, in the early 70s, particularly in my time, you went to your lawyer, you went to your doctor, you went to your banker. These were all your peers, you know, in terms of age. And they had instant credibility. You go to your dentist, everybody's young. Because Boston had this uh, you know, unique collection of great colleges and quality of life and pedestrian-oriented city and small scale that attracted people to either come or stay. So Boston afforded me the ability. I mean, I opened up my own practice when I was 28 years old. But you had vision. I think that's another big part of this. But if I was in New York, if I was in New York and I tried to do what I did at 28 years of age, I would never have gotten a client base. I would never have been viewed as someone who could take on a $60 million hotel. Okay. So some of my first projects when I went off on my own was you know, a major hotel project in Washington, D.C., the old Shoreham Hotel that we did a $60 million renovation on. The Omni Parker House was the Dunphy Parker House, the Copley Plaza Hotel here. You know, here I am, a guy in my 20s and early 30s, you know, having major corporations believing in my vision that if I was in New York, I don't think I would have been able to attract that client base. But in Boston, it was about your talent and not about your age that you could be successful in. 
And I would say for people today, believe in yourself, believe in what your message is that you're trying to get across, believe in the product if you're trying to create a product or a profession that you want to go into, and use that opportunity to create your own lane. Right. And, and, and the world we live in today with social media, social media has changed huge. everything. Everything. So, in the last three or four years, particularly the last three years, I've invested heavily in branding what I do through social media, between Hows and Pinterest and, and my websites. I've, I've now become a national brand, not just a regional brand. And I'm doing projects in Seattle, in Dallas, in Detroit. Traverse City. A lot of work in Detroit. A lot of work in Detroit. Working on a new hotel project in Gross Point, Michigan. I've been able to look at Detroit as, as another renaissance as Boston was in the early 70s. And you and my, would attribute most of this off of social media, being able to... Well, I think my, my message of what I do has gotten a much bigger audience. We were fortunate enough to design the HGTV Dreamhouse two years ago, which had national media attention. There were 94 million people tried to win that house. That was like unheard of in, in all of their home network. In six weeks, 94 million people tried to win a house that I designed. And HGTV was smart enough and, and was listening to me enough that I was a feature in that whole presentation of how that house came to be and the role of the architect, which was important to me that that would be featured. Otherwise, I wasn't going to work with them on, on that particular project. Um, really, I think, help the public understand what my profession is about and, and what the role an architect plays, but also saw the end result, which was so much better than other dream houses that they had tried to put together, and far better than the ones they've done of late. So it really, I think, was an important juncture point in my practice that put me on the national stage in a very positive way coupled with people being able to go on my website or, or, or look me up or go on Instagram or house and all of a sudden I'm getting calls three four hundred calls a month for projects all around the country I just I just did a project in England on a little island off of the southern tip of England um, my reach a client in Australia you know in Brisbane Australia wants me to do a house so it's it's really changed everything so I would say for other people that are looking to, you know, grow a business, really take advantage of, of what social media can offer. It, it really does change everything. And, and your message gets a much bigger audience. No, I think your, your message is very powerful. It's, it's the understanding of embracing social media, the understanding of embracing the business the culture side of architecture. Um, because those are, you know, those are the vehicles that kind of escalated you from an uh, 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 architect to a well-known architect that has so many... And the things that I, that I, that I, I mean, I'm a trustee of Syracuse University. I'm also on the advisory board of the architecture school. And one of the things I work with the dean on is getting architecture students to take classes in the law school, in, in business law, wow. take courses in, in the business school on, on understanding contracts and how to run a business. Uh, because most architecture schools today never train anybody coming out of school any aspect of the real world. Wow. And we live in a litigious society, and people need to understand what that all means and, and how to prepare a contract that protects yourself, that's fair and reasonable to the client, but at the same time, you have rights, and, and that you also need to, how to understand you know, running a financially successful business. One of the things about your business that I've, I've heard and like is you have a pretty good team. I do. I, uh, so you ha can you talk to me about your team and the different so, pieces? So one of the things I did early on when I first moved to Boston was I volunteered to teach at the Boston Architectural Center. Now it's called the Boston Architectural College for free. So I taught there for six years. And I taught urban design studios and I took design studios and rendering classes. And I was teaching there three nights a week as my way of giving back to my profession. That's awesome. But at the same time, I was able to groom and find students of mine that ultimately I hired to work for me. And so even to this day, some 40 some years later, I still support heavily the Boston Architectural College and I have one, two, three, I have four or five 
students from the Boston Architectural College. They go to classes at night and work in the firm by day. So I really believe in that process. And that affords people that don't have a lot of money to be able to work and still go to a, a, a prestigious professional school of architecture that is recognized by, by all the national boards as, as a proper degree school um, and do it in an affordable way. So, you know, that's one of the other messages that I think is really important. As I became more successful financially, I feel very strongly about giving back to our society and giving back to the places that I've earned my living in. So it's a do good, um, doing good by doing good, right? right. So and, and, and in the community you live in, you know, get involved. I was on the planning board for five years in the town that I live in. Um, I'm on the, I'm the vice president of the Preservation Trust on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, you know, we do a lot of things very quietly, you know, about helping uh, you know, support the fireworks on 4th of July, planting flowers on Main Street in Edgartown, um, doing the right thing, and, and, and being known for being someone that gives back to the community is really important in whatever profession you're in. One of the things I really like about Eastern Bank is there, and when it was Wainwright, giving back to the community. I've been with the bank since it opened, virtually. And, uh, and because the social importance of our society and having corporations reach out to where they are placed is so important. And it really creates a richer environment for all of us. And it's, it's the right thing to do. I think, it, and just to kind of elaborate, it, it, it also brings like-minded individuals. So for myself is I met I, I recruited Eastern Bank because of their work in the That's right. And you and I talked about that when I met about, you at the bank. And I think that's part of the reason why we we connected so well is because we understood the importance of giving back and, 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 and being a part of the community and, and being involved and volunteering and I think these are really essential parts of our generation moving forward and it needs to continue to be It also it also affords all of us to have a richer life. I mean, there's a good Goodness that comes from doing Absolutely. good, service. And, and and service and helping, and um, so you know I do that uh, in my professional life. I do it in my family life, and and mentoring is really really important. And so you know we we get interns every year, and we do that. I intern everybody in the office, and so the way I set up my practice is you know people have been with me a long time, but. And they also appreciate what you've done for them, too. So it's a different level of, of confidence. I give them a lot relief, of responsibility. Loyalty, and, you know, I let them get at the end of the diving board, and if they <laughs> fall off, I'll pick them up. But, Absolutely. you know, I also let them be able to spring on that board and, and to go Have the opportunity. Like, and meet clients and understand the business side of the business. I try to teach them, well, look, you know, we've, we've got billing opportunities here that we need to work on this, this, and this because we also have deadlines, but we need, to, we need to move the question, which goes back to my New York DNA. Let's move the job process along. Let's not compromise quality, but let's not spend six weeks worrying about a doorknob. Absolutely. Um, Patrick, I want to appreciate you for being on Lifted. I really believe it's, it's going to be the mentorship platform for others to support them and where they're trying to go. Um, so I want to thank you. Anything else you want to share before we finish? Uh, last thing, impressions or thoughts? Uh, I would say... Uh, you know, whatever people are thinking about as a career or an interest, believe in yourself, never give up. My mantra in life has always been, I will never give up. From the day I'm in that blizzard in the Volkswagen bus, I said, I could have just folded the tent then. I said, I will never give up. I will never, ever give up. If it's not plan A, it's plan B, the plan C, D, E, F, G, it. whatever it. it is, use your smarts, use your intelligence. And you will be successful. Dance outside the box. That's right. I love it. Appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank you.